20 plus ideas to supercharge your creativity. Episode 582. Today's sponsor is the U.S. Toyota Dream Car Art Contest. Stay tuned at the end of the show to learn how students in the United States can enter this inspiring contest and get lesson plans to design a dream car that makes the world a better place. The 10 Minute Teacher Podcast with Vicki Davis. Every weekday, you'll learn powerful, practical ways to be a more remarkable teacher today. So today we're going to talk about supercharging creativity in your classroom. The first idea is to make a learning launch pad in the digital world. So we can see this with HyperDocs. I encourage you to go to hyperdocs.co and look up all the HyperDocs they have there. But for example, I use um, HyperDoc... um, choice board for typing games. And that's not super creative, but it does give kids choice in that way. Um, But I like to use HyperDoc choice boards for app smashing or app ideas. So for example, if you have a project, you can give kids several ideas, have them inside a box, talk about how you can use them, and then even leave an open one for, you know, you could also find apps that do this, this, or this. And sort of have them document their learning journey by coloring in the box of the apps that they use. They can do comments on what they discovered about each app. And then their final item that they created and how many apps they smashed together to make that. Third, a learning library in the physical world. So I have books that I've organized on topic. Students interested in drawing, I've got five or six books that talk about the different drawing techniques that they can pull out and they can take a look at. If I'm having an invention convention where students are inventing and creating new things and basically they'll get off three days and their only requirement is they invent or create something new to contribute to the classroom. So I'll have books on movies, books on photography, books on a lot of different topics. If I find magazines, for example, I was at Sam's and I found a really cool one on Photoshop. I brought that, I put that into the learning library. And I show kids where these libraries are. They can use them anytime. So if a student says, hey, I'm interested in stop motion photography, I want to go open it up and pull out that stop motion photography book that I have and loan it out from my library. I think it's important for kids to see that there are a lot of cool things inside books and use them as a jumping off point. But in that learning library, I also have hands-on and tinkering type things. So yes, I'll have things you can decorate with and things you can make with, but I'll also have things that not really ready-made projects, but projects that kind of point kids in a direction that they can tinker and they can play with. Another way to have a learning library is actually to teach the kids how to use the tutorials inside the program. So for example, we give our kids the full Adobe suite uh, for grades eight through 12. I teach them how they can go in Adobe Illustrator. Look, you've got these tutorials on the right. I teach them how to go through those tutorials and how to find cool things that they can do both on that site as well as Adobe Education Exchange. That is part of their library is understanding that they can go to the help and they can find things in the program, but also curating playlists by topic on YouTube. So making a YouTube playlist, and if I do a lot with film, I'll collect all of those under one playlist. If I do a lot with drawing, I'll collect those under another playlist. And this gives you an already curated playlist. I have to do this, especially in film, because so many people, for whatever reason, that work in film or make film use a lot of profanity. Well, I can't have that for sharing in my classroom. It's not safe for my classroom. So I do have to listen and watch all those videos ahead of time. And so I put them in a playlist so that I can find them ahead of time. And I know a fifth grade teacher at my school who does that as well. Then we have making materials. So not only do I have the books that say how to draw this and that, but I have a lot of the materials that they can draw with. I have some unique calligraphy type pens. I have some sort of brush stroke like ink pens that you can use to draw cartoons with. So I have those materials near those books so that kids can kind of get those things out. Now, another thing I do with my making materials is that I label them with not only the contents of what's in the plastic box, but also the roll. So for example, in my film cabinet, I will have, you know, all the electrical supplies and I'll have gaffer electrical supplies because the gaffer would use that. I'll have my slate with my second AD or second assistant director. I'll have wardrobe, wigs, and I have the actual name of the department. I'll have sound engineer in the sound gear. So By having those roles, the students are aware of the role that they're playing, but they're also aware of the contents in the box. 
And I've given them the name of a role so they can look up and find other materials that someone in that role may use. I'm probably going to go back and do that with my library as well as put labels of the kind of role that would want that book or want that material so I can get kids thinking about, you know, careers without really pushing it at them. They're just kind of there right in front of them. Now, another part of creativity is students having effective search strategies. I can't tell you how many students I've noticed just don't know basic what I call search engine math. So for example, just knowing, you know, for example, if we're doing presentations and I'm teaching basic PowerPoint, I do that with kind of a sandbox strategy where they're exploring and learning about PowerPoint. And then on my rubric, I'll actually require one or two cool PowerPoint hacks. And I'll say, wow, me, show me something I haven't seen before. And then I'll teach them, type in cool PowerPoint hacks. Try to find cool things that you can do with PowerPoint. You're not trying to break PowerPoint. You're trying to do some cool stuff with it. So to teach them to look that up, but also tips for drawing whatever. But then you want to teach them the wild card. The wild card is the asterisk so that they can find different things that are spelled different ways. So helping them understand the asterisk or if they're getting research and for example, if they're searching for Native American Indians, but they come up with a lot of casinos, they can do minus casino and take out all the casino results so they can find other information on that particular topic. Understanding search strategies so that they can kind of make more effectively and build more effectively. Now, the other part of being creative and, and making is helping make mentors. So there are many times that some of the film experts that may come in and teach us about different aspects of film, producing film or directing film or acting in film, and we'll record that. And I can use that with later classes. So that person never has to come back and talk on that same topic. They can come back and talk about other topics. So when you have people into your class, that's awesome, but also filming it and making it part of your class mentor library is so cool. And kids can come in and see that, but also having student mentors. And we have a club um, program in my school where every Wednesday we have club activities. And I like my high school and my middle school film club, we call it the press corps, meet together so that each student has to have someone who's mentoring them and they have to have someone that they're mentoring. Now, if they're new in their beginning, they're probably just going to have a mentor. They're not going to be ready to mentor somebody yet. But as soon as they kind of get some expertise, I will bring somebody in under them because so many things are better taught one-on-one. Having student mentors, but for example, my film class, we use Slack to communicate and I'm in the process of creating a mentor channel. And I've got a couple people who've agreed, okay, if your kids have questions and they want to ask it, just let them put it in that mentor channel in Slack. But then you can also adopt mentors. So you can teach students, you know, if, if it's a particular topic, for example, Steve Hullfish, wrote a great book called The Art of the Cut. I've had him on this podcast before. I had him in recorded uh, something with him, but there's also the book that he has. And he's also still continually doing interviews and posting with a blog. So if my students are interested in editing, I not only introduce them to the book that I have and the video of when he visited my class through Skype, but also I'll introduce them to his blog so he they can see what he's sharing right now and connect because you can adopt mentors, even if they don't know who you are, helping kids understand these amazing people that they can learn from. Also, in your creativity supercharged toolkit, you want to look for giftedness and interest. When a student says they're interested in something, you want to nurture and direct those things. Like I said, you know, stop motion photography or macro photography, where you're taking really close ups. And I got last year, one of the greatest ideas came from one of my students. And she said, Oh, have you ever seen these little people? And I'm like, little people? And it's like, yeah, in your hand, you can hold a hundred little people. And I was like, oh, I've been looking for something to teach this. And I was trying to teach the principle of thirds with macro photography, but I had a kind of a large class. I didn't really want to take everybody outside to do that activity. So we were able to do it right there in class. And I bought these hundred little people for like $12. And it was such a cool activity. So just by nurturing that interest that the student had, I learned from the student she showed me on Pinterest and told me what hashtag to look for on Pinterest. I can't remember it. I think it was little people or something like that. And I was able to look and see all of these really cool ideas. And that was so very exciting to nurture that interest, but also to have my very own interest as well. That's just so neat. 
Another one is work with your school to have a scheduled time that even if a kid can't take your class, that they can get exposed to your topic, whether it's agriculture or cooking or lots of different topics. And that's clubs are such a, and special interest times are such a great way to do that. You can also issue challenges. So you can have contests and activities. For example, with our Sherwood Showstoppers student broadcast, we, uh, we just met 100 subscribers. We're so excited. I have got a couple of kids throughout the school that said, hey, we want to report too. And so I let them once a month do a special report behind the scenes of Peter Pan in our theater group. So issue challenges and let kids participate and have those activities as well. A special interest project. Students need a way to make more than 100. If they have something that just fascinates them. For example, I had a student who went really, really deep on using Bloxels to make their own video games. And then I was traveling with a chess team and this particular student was going and he said, hey, can you bring your iPad and the Bloxels so that I can kind of tinker? And I let him tinker all the way to the chess, which was two hours and all the way back, which was another two hours. And he really got deep, deep into programming just in that special interest time and making it available to it, you know, outside normal hours and, uh, and giving him a way to make more than 100. And he was letting kids test his games and getting that feedback. And oh, that was so much fun. Now, one of the best ways to supercharge creativity is to expose students to other kids doing cool things. Now, in our student news broadcast, we work really hard to cover lots of different topics in the school, but having kids cross ages and cross times with each other, for example, one of the, we shot a video commercial for something called Island Time that we were having at a ball game and everyone was going to wear, you know, Hawaiian gear to the particular ball game and have spirit. And that was going to be all kinds of fun. And so we had our middle schoolers be the extras in that film shoot. We've got a film shoot coming up this week as I'm recording this, that we're going to have extras for this really cool thing for homecoming that we're doing. And then they get to see an actual film shoot happen and they love it and they get so excited. But just creating ways for us to get exposed to one another and the things that other places are doing. You know, kids sometimes like to go to the familiar. And if you can at least let them see something new or something different, then they can uh, be exposed to that and that will amp up their creativity. You know, there's so many different ideas to create and invent. And I think also part of it is you as a teacher, if you can let them see you creating and inventing and trying new things. And when I create or invent or try something new in my class, I'll say, hey, guys, this is a new video I just created to teach this. Let me know how it goes. I'm not sure if I'm going to do it this way again. So I need your feedback. And they can be part of that creation process. I think also when you do creation, you've got to help the kids get on in on ideation. And I've talked about this extensively before about the process of brainstorming. But for example, when I have my students come up with their app names, they have to come up with 50 ideas before they pick one. Usually the best idea will be somewhere around 25 or 26 or 27. It's usually not at the beginning and a lot of times it's not at the end, but it often comes after you have a big laugh and everybody just kind of says, you know what, we're just going to come up with ideas. Because we've got so many ideas we have to come up with that we're just not going to worry about whether they're good or not anymore. We're just going to throw the ideas out there. And when that happens in brainstorming, that is when you really start seeing the creativity shine and kids really start doing some amazing things. Creativity, it's something that all of our students need to have. We know that rote and routine can be automated, outsourced. It can be programmed in AI because it's replicable, duplicable, but it's the creative things. It's the innovative things. That's what we have to do. So I hope that this toolkit to supercharge your creativity will help you do just that. Today's sponsor is the U.S. Toyota Dream Car Art Contest. It opens November 1st, 2019 through January 31st, 2020. It's for youth ages 4 through 15 in the United States. In the U.S. Toyota Dream Car Art Contest, students are invited to submit hand-drawn artwork answering this question. If you could design a car to make the world a better place, what would it look like? Teachers can also download a free standards-aligned lesson plans on car design that includes both STEM concepts and art. That makes this an excellent cross-curricular project. Visit www.toyotadreamcarusa dot com forward slash cool cat. There you can download artwork guidelines, official rules, an entry form, and the lesson plan to prepare your Toyota Dream Car USA artwork submissions today. 
Remember, that's at toyotadreamcarusa.com forward slash cool cap. Today, I just encourage you for your challenge to consider how you can add more creativity into your classroom. Just pick one of these ideas I've shared or another one of your own that you have found online or Pinterest or wherever you look for creative ideas. Let's create and let's innovate.